Chapter 2, Section 3, The Product and Quotient Rules, and Higher Order Derivatives. Now in this section, we're going to go over two key properties for finding derivatives, the product rule and the quotient rule. Now with the sum rule, we said that the derivative of a sum was the sum of the derivatives. It doesn't work that nicely with product rules and with quotient rules. They're a little bit more complicated, uh, and uh, you're going to have to make sure that you spend the time necessary to put these to memory because they're going to be used a lot throughout this uh, text and throughout this, um, um, uh, for the AP test, I should say. So we're going to start off by taking the derivative of a product. And again, it's not just the product of the derivatives. There's a little bit to it. And that's this first theorem here that states for the product rule that the product of two differentiable functions, f and g, is itself differentiable. Moreover, I like to use the word moreover when I can. The derivative of f times g is the first function times the derivative of the second function plus the second function times the derivative of the first function. Or in notation, d, uh, the derivative with respect to x of f of x times g of x is f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x. It says if each one takes a turn getting the derivative taken. All right, so let's find a derivative of h of x here. Now we could go ahead and do FOIL here, write this out as a polynomial, and then take the derivative as we did in the last section. But I'm going to go ahead and use the product rule here. So h prime of x is the first one times the derivative of the second. So that's 9x squared plus 5 times the derivative of the second, which would be 4x plus 3. Plus the second one, which is, oops, plus the second one, which is 2x squared plus 3x, times the derivative of the first one here, which is just 18x, because the derivative of 5 is 0. Now, I'm not going to leave my answer like this. Even though it's going to be kind of a pain, I'm going to go ahead and simplify this. So this is going to be 36x to the third plus 27x squared plus 20x plus 15. We'll FOIL there, a little distributive here, plus 36x to the third plus 54x to the second. Combine like terms, I find h prime of x to be 72x to the third plus 81x to the second plus 20x plus 15. And I tell you, if you take the time and if you FOIL that out and then take the derivative of that polynomial, you're going to get right to this guy. Next guy up, another product. Now, I can't do the, the alternative way by multiplying these together because this is a polynomial and this is a trig function. So I definitely have to use the product rule here. g prime of x, it's the first one, x squared, there are my two functions, times the derivative of the second one, which is negative sine x, plus the second one, which is the cosine of x, times the derivative of the first one, which is 2x. So that gives me negative x squared sine of x plus 2x cosine of x. Now there's nothing wrong with leaving it in this form. If you factor out an x, that's okay. But since you won't have any like terms, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it in this form. This is my g prime of x. So the product rule isn't all that bad. It just takes a little practice. Here's another one here. Uh, 5x, y equals 5x times the sine of x minus 3 times the cosine of x. So y prime, here's my product. This is not a product here. I know there's a constant here, but that's a constant multiple. So it's the first one. By the way, the product rule works on constant multiples because the derivative of 3 is 0. You won't get two terms. But here, it's the first one times the derivative of the second one, which is the cosine of x, plus the second one, which is the sine of x, times the derivative of the first one, which is 5, minus three times the co derivative of the cosine of x, which is negative sine x. So this gives me 5x cosine x plus 5 sine x, okay, plus 3 sine x. All right. Had a, just had a visit here at the door from the gentleman doing the work in the ceiling. So this is equal to, I guess I picked the wrong time of the day, to make videos plus 8, sorry about the extraneous noise, times the sine of x. I went ahead and combined like terms here. Now this next one's got a little twist to it. It says, let y equal u times v be the product of functions u and v. 
Find y prime of 2. If u of 2 is 3, u prime of 2 is negative 4, v of 2 is 1, and v prime of 2 is 2. This is kind of weird looking. But here, if I have y equals u times v, then y prime is equal to u times v prime plus v times u prime. And then they just want us to plug this in at 2. So y prime of 2, which can be also written as y prime when uh, uh, t or x, whatever my independent variable is, is equal to 2, would be equal to, well, u of 2, which is 3, times v prime of 2, which is 2, plus v of 2, which is 1, times u prime of 2, which is negative 4. So I have 6 minus 4 or 2. Kind of an unusual problem notation wise. A little bit of a, a little bit messy there. All right. Now the product rule not only works when you have a product of two functions, but you can expand this to three functions, four functions, however many you want, as, a, as long as it's a product and they're all differentiable, by again making sure that each one takes a turn. Here's the derivative of f of x times g of x times h of x. So see how in the first part it's the product, but the first one takes its turn at the derivative plus, okay, the second one, it's a, again, it's the product of all three except that the middle one's taking the derivative and then plus all three, but the last one's taking its turn getting the derivative. And you can do this for more than three functions, although I doubt if you'll ever see more than three functions. Now, one of my favorite guys is the quotient rule. The quotient rule is a little bit more complicated than the product rule. All right, it says the quotient f over g of two differentiable functions f and g, it's itself differentiable at all values of x for which g prime of, or g of x does not equal zero. It can't get zero in the denominator. Moreover, the derivative of f over g is given by the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator all over and divide it by the square of the denominator. Look at this mess. The derivative with respect to x of f of x over g of x is g of x times f prime of x minus f of x times g prime of x. Kind of like they take their turns, but there's a minus sign, so you have to make sure you have the right order, all over the denominator squared. Now, when I was teaching years ago at the first high school that I taught at, we got a new math teacher, actually math slash physics teacher, and he asked me what I was working on in my calculus class, I said, oh, we're doing the quotient rule. And he says, did you ever give him the Lodi high? And I had no idea what he was talking about, so he explained it to me. And I've always told my students since, I believe his name was Adrian. He's a really smart guy. He had, um, I think he'd been accepted to like medical school at Harvard and was uh, deciding to go back, I think, to become a lawyer. But he taught for a couple, a couple three years with me. All right, so right here we have high numerator, the low denominator, and when I take the derivative, d for derivative. So this is low d high minus high d low all over the square of what's below. Low d high minus high d low all over the square of what's below. Or you can just say over the square of what's below. Some, some teachers say square the denominator and away we go. But it rhymes that way and it's a mnemonic that hopefully will help you to keep track of this. So now I'm going to do some uh, derivatives here of quotients. First, oh, I've got my equal sign here. First guy up, f of x, which is 2x minus 1 over 5x squared plus 3. f prime of x is equal to low, that's the denominator, 5x squared plus 3 d high times the derivative of the numerator, well the derivative of 2x minus 1 is 2, minus the numerator, which is 2x minus 1, times the derivative of the denominator, which is 10x, all over the denominator squared, so that's 5x squared plus 3 quantity squared. So up top, I have to distribute, I'm going to get, um, and again, I wouldn't work straight down, step by step by step in a vertical manner, except that I didn't give myself enough space. Silly me. So this is um, 10x squared plus 6, that's this first part, minus, and that's going to be 20x squared, so minus 20x squared, and then minus, and they have a minus here, so that's going to be minus a negative 10x or plus 10x. 
and that's all over my denominator squared. Now, you can square the denominator, but it's already in factored form, so it's not really that bad of an idea to kind of leave it this way in case the numerator factors and something might cancel. It's not going to happen here. So that gives me f prime of x is equal to, combining like terms, negative 10x squared plus 10x plus 6 all over the quantity 5x squared plus 3 quantity squared. Now, yes, I could factor a 2 out of this. I could factor a negative 2 out of this. But if I do, it's not going to factor any further, and nothing's going to cancel top and bottom. So this is not the world's worst way to answer it. However, if you were checking an answer in the back of the book, they might have it a little different because they may have simplified it in a certain way. Maybe they even squared the denominator. Usually that's not the case. Now, part B can also be done with the quotient rule. It's just that your denominator is a constant. So you don't have to do it as a quotient rule. You could rewrite this as 9 fourths x squared plus 5 fourths. Then take the derivative of this using your power rule. So this is going to be 9 halves x and the derivative of 5 fourths is 0. There's my answer. If you decided to use the quotient rule, and I'll come over here and try to show you, g prime of x would be low d high minus high d low and the derivative of 4 is 0 all over the square of what's below, 16. So this is going to give me 72x all this becomes 0 over 16, and if I divide top and bottom by 8, I get 9x all over 2, which is the same thing that I have here. Now, this guy here, I'm going to definitely use the quotient rule, but I think I'll probably distribute first and write this as negative 6x plus 15. I could go ahead and pop the 3 out in front. In fact, I could go ahead and pop a 3 7 out in front as a constant. But I'm just going to kind of go with it here because you guys haven't done a bunch of these problems yet. And I'm going to use the quotient rule. So h prime of x is equal to 7x squared times the derivative of the numerator, which is negative 6, minus the quantity negative 6x plus 15, the numerator, times the derivative of the denominator, 14x, all over the denominator squared, which would be 49x to the fourth. So this is negative 42x squared. I have to distribute here. That's going to be a negative 84x squared minus. So plus 84x squared, definitely some like terms. That's going to be plus 70x minus, so minus 70x all over 49x to the fourth. Combine like terms, I get 42x squared minus 70x all over 49x to the fourth. Well, it's a good thing I take the time to simplify this because I can factor out a 7x on top. Now you say, well, couldn't you factor out a 14? Yes, I could, but 14 doesn't divide into 49, so I'm not. So I can cancel out a 7 with a 7 here, and an x with an x here. It leaves an x to the third. So that gives me h prime of x to be 6x minus 10 all over 7x to the third power. There we go. Next guy up, another quotient rule, threw a trig function in, k prime of x is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which is the cosine of x, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, which is 2x, all over the denominator squared. So that's, oops, that's x squared plus 1 quantity squared. All right, well, let's see. Not a lot is going to simplify here. I, I can go ahead and multiply up top. That would be x squared cosine x plus the cosine of x minus 2 times the sine, 2x times the sine of x. All over the denominator squared. And again, I'm not going to square that out because nothing's going to simplify up here. 
and nothing's going to cancel top and bottom so I'm going to leave them as is. Now this guy here with the uh, 1 over x you can leave them as 1 over x but you could also multiply top and bottom by x to get rid of the complex fraction. Okay. Now just for the thrill of it I'm going to leave them as 1 over x but again you can multiply top and bottom by x it'd be 4x minus 1 over x squared plus 3x probably less aggravation because there won't be that rational but let's see what we can do here. y prime equals now it's the denominator which is x plus 3 times the derivative of the numerator. Now the derivative of 4 is 0. Minus 1 over x that's the same as minus x to the negative 1. So the derivative of that would be 1x to the positive 2 or to the negative 2. So that would be 1 over x squared minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator which is just 1 all over the denominator squared. Now, I probably wouldn't leave the, the fractions in the numerator, so I would multiply top and bottom by x squared. And that's going to give me x plus 3 minus x all over the denominator of x squared times the quantity x plus 3 quantity squared, or the x's cancel. y prime, can you see that? I hope you can see that okay. Turns out to be a positive 3 all over x squared times the quantity x plus 3 quantity squared. Kind of cool. I don't know. Kind of cool in a nerd way anyway. And there we are. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the product rule and the quotient rule to help us not only with uh, uh, trig functions because we have trig functions that are quotients of functions uh, of other trig functions. Tangent of x is the sine of x with the cosine of x. But we'll also see if we can do some work here uh, to, to be able to work with n uh, negative exponents and such just as much. Alright, so I'll move this over here and bring this on up. Okay, we stated that the power rule for derivatives where the exponent n was a positive integer greater than 1, we can extend this to include all integers as exponents, which I think we've already kind of done, but we were kind of shortcutting our way through it here, that x to the opposite of n the derivative using the 1 over x to the n using the quotient rule turns out to be negative n or the opposite of nx to the opposite of n minus 1. Now what that does is it just allows us to just use the power rule. So f prime of x would be negative 8x to the negative 9 or negative 8 all over x to the 9. As I mentioned we kind of jumped the gun a little bit and kind of showed this in advance. Alright, to use the quotient rule for the derivatives of sine and cos or for tangent and cotangent and such we're going to go ahead and first off make a statement that the derivative of the tangent of x is equal to secant squared x the derivative of the cotangent of x is negative cosecant squared x the derivative of the secant of x is secant of x tangent of x that's weird that it has itself in it and the derivative of the cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x cotangent of x let's go back to this guy I'm going to kind of flip the page over here and just show you this is bonus coverage here. The derivative of the tangent of x is the derivative of the sine of x over the cosine of x which is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator which would be negative sine x all over the denominator squared. So this gives me cosine squared x minus a negative plus sine squared x all over cosine squared x. Well, look at that numerator. That's a Pythagorean identity. This is equal to 1. And 1 over cosine is secant, so 1 over cosine squared x would be secant squared x. Let's go back. And that was our guy. We can find this one very similarly as well as these by using the quotient rule. So let's find the derivative. Now we don't have to go through the quotient rule every time we have a trig function. We can just put these to memory and you do need to have those memorized. So find the derivative of each. y equals 5x minus the cotangent of x. Well y prime then would be 5. Now the derivative of cotangent of x is negative cosecant squared x. So negative cotangent x, negative negative that would be plus cosecant squared x. Easy pleasy. Here I have to use a product rule to see the product of the two functions. So g prime of x is the first one 
times the derivative of the second. Now the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant x cotangent of x. Negative cosecant, oops, of x cotangent of x. Uh, let's see, plus the derivative of, I'm sorry, I was thinking about something else, can't walk and chew gum at the same time. The cosecant of x times the derivative of the second one, which is 2x. So this would be opposite x squared cosecant x cotangent x plus 2x cosecant x. And this is going to be, I could leave it like in this, or I could even factor out, if I, if I got uh, a little ambitious, I could factor out an x cosecant x. And I get the opposite of x cotangent x plus 2. Now, or I can even pop out a negative 1. So if you get to here and you look in the back of the book and you're checking your answer, and they have something that looks like this, don't panic. Sometimes it takes more time to rewrite your answer to match the answer in the back of the book than it does just to solve it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we mentioned before in the previous section, we did an example, that the derivative of a position is velocity. As it turns out, if we take the derivative of a velocity, we get acceleration. So you're taking the derivative of a derivative, which means something different. We, it's what we call a higher order derivative. Um, and, but you can take the derivative of a derivative. Now, the derivative of a function is a function. The derivative of a derivative would also be a function. So we have, when you take the derivative twice or three times, four times, however many times you need to. So we first, we'll get used to some notation for higher order derivatives. We have a function y equals f of x. Take its derivative, we get y prime equals f prime of x. Take the derivative of this, gives us y double prime equals f double prime of x. And that's the second derivative. Two primes, second derivative. So here I've got some of the notation here with y prime, y double prime, y triple prime. Now, once you get more than three primes, it starts getting messy and you don't do like one, two, three, four, and then across. So you put it in uh, the number, but inside parentheses so it doesn't look like it's a power. So this would be the fourth derivative. This would be the nth derivative. Same thing with the primes here on your app. F prime of x, F double prime of x, triple prime of x, but then in parentheses, you put the little four there so you don't think it's F to the fourth power. And then F to the nth. The nth derivative, I should, shouldn't say F to the nth. The nth derivative of F uh, with respect to x. Leibniz, Leibniz notation is kind of weird. See how they have dy over dx? Then they put the two for the second derivative in between in the numerator, but on the end, like their exponents in the denominator, then the threes and the fours and the ends, however many you take that. All right? So, uh, the old fashioned uh, uh, derivative operator uh, notation with the capital D, you just have what that looks like the little exponents there for the first derivative, the second, the third, the fourth, the nth derivative. And very similar here, Leibniz guy. Uh, notation here on this as well. So given, let's, let's do an example, given y equals 4x to the fourth plus 3x to the third plus 2x to the second plus x, find the first three derivatives, y prime, okay, one term at a time would be 16x to the third plus 9x to the second plus 4x plus 1, that's your first derivative, y double prime, take the derivative of this, now one term at a time, 48x squared plus 18x, plus 4, take the next derivative, y triple prime, that would be one term at a time, 96x plus 18, and there are your first three derivatives. Now look right here, trig function, y equals the cosine of x, find the first four derivatives here, to find the first four derivatives here, y prime equals, well we already know what the derivative of the cosine of x is, hopefully we already put in memory, it's negative sine x, the derivative of negative sine x would be, now this is like a constant here of 1, so it would be negative 1 times the derivative of the sine of x, which is the cosine of x, so this is negative cosine of x. y triple prime would be the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine x, and I already have a negative there, so that would be positive sine x. And then the fourth derivative, because it wants the first four, the derivative of the sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. And look, I got right back to where I started. So when you take the derivative of uh, multiple derivatives of cosine or sine, they repeat every four, uh, almost like they're, they're uh, cyclic. All right, next guy up. Y equals X to the second, find the first five derivatives. Y prime equals 2X. 
y double prime equals 2, because the derivative of x is just 1. y triple prime is the derivative of a constant is 0. And then, of course, after this, they're all going to be 0. The fourth derivative, 0. The fifth derivative, 0. So eventually, if you take enough derivatives of a polynomial, you're going to get down to 0. All right, let's see if we can apply this somehow. Here's a nice problem. A dynamite blast propels a heavy rock straight up with a launch velocity of 160 feet per second, or which is approximately 109 miles per hour. It reaches a height of s equals 160t minus 16t squared feet after t seconds. How high does the rock go? It shoots up, then comes back down to earth. Well, it reaches its peak when the velocity is zero. Think about that. When the velocity is zero, it goes up, it's positive velocity, and then it pauses for an instant before it comes back down and has negative velocity. So we hit zero when it, when it pauses for that instant. So I need to know when the velocity is zero. So I have s is, here I'll call it s of t just to make it convenient, 160t minus 16t squared. Velocity is 160 minus 32t. So I need to know when the velocity is zero. So I said 160 minus 32t equal to zero. Uh, 32t equals 160. Divide by 32, t is equal to 5. So it takes 5 seconds for it to peak, and then it drops back down. It takes 5 seconds up. It's probably going to take 5 seconds to come down because you're firing this up off the ground. So how high does the rock go? Well, we need to know what s of 5 is. s of 5, the position. 160 times 5 minus 16 times 5 squared. This is 800 minus 400 is 400. So the rock reaches a height of 400 feet. Don't forget your units. Short sentence. What is the velocity and the speed of the rock when it is 256 feet above the ground on the way up and on the way down? Well, let's think what we can do here. We want to find when they position the times uh, so that we, uh, when the rock is 256 feet up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take s of t, which is 160t minus 16t squared, and I'm going to set it equal to 256, so that's the height. So if I set this and solve this equation right here, I get 16t squared minus 160t um, plus 256 equals 0. Now I went ahead and I wrote it this way so that you can see it's in standard form. I can divide through by 16, nice. And then I can factor this. Now there should be two times, going up, coming back down somewhere, it has to hit 256 feet high. So let's see, t minus two times t minus eight. So that's gonna give me t equals two and t equals eight. Two seconds after it launches, it's uh, 256 feet up, it continues going up to 400 feet, then it comes back down, and eight seconds after it's launched, it's at 256 feet again on its way down. So what are the velocity and speeds? Well, the velocity of two would be going to here, 160 minus 32 times two. This is on the way up, so it's gonna be positive. This is 96, and the velocity on the way down Oops, at 8, this would be 160 minus 32 times 8, which is negative 96. Yep, negative 96. So I, I did everything except give myself enough room to answer it. And by the way, these are the velocities. The speeds are the absolute value, so they're going to both be positive 96. So the velocity, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to squeeze it all in, but the velocity of the rock on the way up is 96 feet per second, as is its speed. The velocity of the rock on the way down 
is negative 96 feet per second and its speed is 96 feet per second. Now I wrote that so small that even if you have probably the world's best vision you're gonna have trouble reading that. I have it on a big screen to my left here and I'm having trouble reading it although my vision is not the best. Sorry about that. The velocity of the rock uh, on the way up um, well, I should say on the way up when it reaches 256 feet is 96 feet per second as it's at speed. Uh, the velocity of the rock on its way down when it's 256 feet above the ground is negative 96 feet per second and its speed is positive 96 feet per second. Now, part C, what is the acceleration of the rock of the, uh, at any time t during its flight after the blast? Well, remember S of t was 160t minus 16t squared. Uh, v of t, the derivative, would be 160 minus 32t. And A of t, the acceleration, is negative 32, which should make sense because of uh, the object being affected by gravity. And gravity is negative 32 feet per second per second. So what's the acceleration? The acceleration is negative 32 feet per second squared. Okay. When does the rock hit the ground? Boy, I wish this rock problem would go away. When does the rock hit the ground? Well, the rock hits the ground uh, when the height is zero. So I'm going to take the position function, s of t, which is 160t minus 16t squared. I'm going to set it equal to zero. I'm going to solve this. I can factor out a negative 16t. That would give me t minus 10. So I get t equals 0 and 10. Well, yeah, the rock's on the ground when it gets ready to blast off. When does the rock hit the ground? 10 seconds after it's uh, initially propelled. So the rock hits the ground 10 seconds after it's launched. All right. Well, it took five seconds to get up to its maximum height of 100 feet. It should take five seconds coming back down since we're neglecting uh, air resistance and such. All right, last example here, which is good because I'm sure you guys are ready to go on to some uh, uh, problems of your own. Uh, an automobile's velocity starting from rest is V of t equals 100t over t, uh, 2t plus 15, where V is measured in feet per second. Find the acceleration at 5 and at 10. This is easy pleasy compared to the other one, except I have to use the quotient rule. Okay, so V of t is 100t all over 2t plus 15. The uh, acceleration, A of t, which is the derivative, is equal to uh, low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. So this is going to be 200t plus 1500 minus 200t. Well, that's going to cancel. That's nice. All over 2t plus 15 quantity squared, which is 1500 all over 2t plus 15 quantity squared. So I want a of 5, and I plug 5 in for t, and I would get 1500 all over 2 times 5 plus 15 squared. So let's see, 2 times 5 is 10 plus 15 is 25, squared is 625. So I have 1500 over 625. Yikes. So what is that? Uh, 60 over 25 divide by 5 again. That would be 12 over 5 that would be 2.4 feet per second squared. And then do the same thing, only this time plug in 10. 1,500, if I can do this one, 2 times 10, might have to grab the calculator here, squared. Let me move this up so you can at least read it. Hopefully you'll be able to read it. So that's 1,500. So that's 2035 squared. I don't know what 35 squared is. It's a thousand and some change. So I'm definitely grabbing a calculator now because 
uh, I don't want to mess this up. So I have 1,500 divided by 35 squared. Oh, they gave me a decimal here. That kind of stinks. Let's think. 35 squared is 1225. So this is 1500 over 1225. 25 goes in that 60. All right, did I get 60 the first time? 25. No, I think they may have messed up here. No, that part's right. 60. And 25 goes into this uh, 49 times. So I have 1 and 11 49ths feet per second squared, or approximately 1.224 feet per second squared. Hopefully, you can see that okay. Most of the problems come out usually pretty nicely. Once in a while, they'll throw a decimal in at you. So, again, practice. Practice, practice.